Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning at First Reformed Church. We're glad you are here to join us in worship on this beautiful uh, Sunday morning. And a special welcome to all those who are joining us online or on television. We welcome you as well this morning. A special welcome to our visitors. We're glad you're here to join us, and we hope that you will not only join us for worship, but that you'll stick around and, and spend a little time here uh, getting to know us as well after the service. In fact, this morning, it's a special morning as we have some fellowship time that's going to be uh, extra special this morning. So as you go out of the doors and take a left and down the hallway, uh, refreshments are very special this morning as we have a reception there for a birthday. And... Uh, uh, so that's going to be going on. There's cake and all kinds of good stuff down there, crackers and cheese, and it's, it's quite the spread. So you'll want to stick around and join us for that special time uh, of fellowship and, and refreshment there. Uh, because of that reception going on, there is no sermon discussion class today, so uh, note, take note of that. And uh, teachers for Sunday school, you're also encouraged maybe to just take a few minutes off of your class time at the end or something to come down and uh, join that reception so the kiddos can uh, help themselves to uh, uh, some of those refreshments and, and treats as well. If you have any questions while you're here this morning, have visitors, you can ask pretty much anybody here. Otherwise, you can go to the uh, booth in the back in the foyer, and there at the information booth, there's someone there who's more than willing to answer your questions, uh, uh, any of those that you may have. Also, taking note of today, uh, there will be no evening Bible study tonight, so make note of that. No evening Bible study only. This does not pertain to the Case for Faith Life Group. That will be meeting as scheduled. So Case for Faith Life Group meeting as scheduled, but no uh, Bible study tonight because the leader, Pastor Bob, is not going to be here. So uh, that's not going to be happening uh, tonight. Uh, elders, take note, after the worship service this morning, there will be a meeting in the library uh, to have a meeting regarding a profession of faith, a couple of professions of faith that are going to be happening. Uh, so make sure you make your way fairly quickly after our service into the library uh, for that. Take note of all the announcements, pull out that yellow sheet, go through it at some point, and look through that, all of the activities and things happening in the life of the church, so that you can use your gifts to be involved in the life of First Reformed Church uh, and have an impact here and in our community. Let us continue to worship our God this morning then, as we come to him in prayer, let us pray together. Oh God, we gather here this morning. Maybe we were a little rushed because of a change in time. Maybe we're feeling a little tired. Whatever the reason, we're here. And our desire is that you will be here. That your presence will be here with us. Opening our hearts and our minds receiving what we bring, that you will transform the gift of our worship, of our lives, into a beautiful gift that is pleasing to you. So come, Holy Spirit, and bless us, we pray, in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and greet one another in the joy of Christ this morning. Morning, church. Good morning. Glad everybody made it this morning. Um, let's just relax and enjoy God's presence today as we sing. Uh, o Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name above the earth. All right? Let's celebrate that today. Good morning.
Sometimes that can happen at an altar like this. I know when I accepted Christ, I did it at an altar like this. And when I was delivered from my drug addiction is when I came to the altar. Um, and sometimes that's appropriate, but sometimes we can do it right where we're at. We can, we can open up our hearts. We can say, God, just touch me, speak to me, change me. And God will come and meet with us. And he stands here today with arms open. And he's saying to us, I love you. I love you. I want to forgive you. I want to give you peace. I want to give you joy. I want to take away your unforgiveness. And he'll do that today. So I just encourage you as you sing this next song, just open your hearts, be honest with the Lord, and ask him to speak to you about what, what he wants to change in your life today. We're going to sing, I'll come to the altar.
deserve it we thank you thank you that you stand here with arms open calling us to you to humble ourselves to submit ourselves to you and in this moment of silence we ask that you speak to our hearts and help us to hear from you and to know what you want us to work on in our life to become more like you lord god in this moment of silence Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you're here, that you meet with us. We ask that you just bless this time. Ask that you bless the decisions that have been made, the commitments that we've made. Help us to go out this week, Lord, and, and to remember those commitments and to, and to become more like you, Lord God. Become a light to a lost and dying world, Lord God. Just, just bless us. Use us, Lord God. And bless this service today, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Join me in our memory verse as we turn to Jeremiah 31. We're going to say the reference, the verse, and then the reference. With one voice we say, Jeremiah 31, 3. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Jeremiah 31, 3. I'd like the children to join me down front for a moment, if they would, please. We're going to stay standing. We're going to stand kind of right here. If we could kind of get everybody right in this little area, that would be helpful. Come on and over this way. Come on, we're going to crowd in a little bit. So let's, you can come on over. Come on over this way. Further this way. Come over by me. I know you don't want to, but I won't bite. I promise. Come on over this way. We need you in a group. I need you in a group. So kind of crowd in right here. 
right here. Come on. It's as hard to get you to do that as to get people to sit in the front row in church. Come on over here. We got more coming. Wow, what a great crew. Isn't it a great morning? Huh? Sun shining, what a beautiful morning this morning. Who's ready for spring? Huh? Are you ready to get out and start playing outside and enjoying that, right? That's great. Have you ever had to do something you know might get you in trouble, but it was the right thing to do? Huh? Sometimes doing the right thing means that we might get in a little trouble. Well, that's where I'm at this morning. I've got to do the right thing, but it might get me in a little bit of trouble. Um, it's, we're having a special celebration today, and there's going to be cake. That's why there's no candy, because I didn't think you needed any more sure there's going to be cake and stuff later for you, because it's Lori's 50th birthday, okay? So we need to celebrate that, and what I was thinking was, I, I sit and listen to her sing songs all the time, so I was trying to think of some of the crazy songs that she gets stuck in my head because she sings them in the office, and I thought some of those, or maybe one of those Yancey children's songs we could really get going on to, to get her, but you know what, I think it's probably just best if we just stick to happy birthday. Does that sound okay? Huh? So we're going to start this together, and then you're going to help us out with this, right, as we sing happy birthday to Lori this morning. So are you ready? One, two, here we go. Okay, you can make your way to hop or back to your seats wherever you need to go. Thanks so much for coming up. I had nothing to do with those, by the way. And you know that. I'm standing up here saying that it's true. At this time, we are going to be led in the ministry of music by pressing on. saying good morning. Are you saying good morning? <laughs> Lord, the light of your love is shining in the midst of the darkness shining. Jesus, light of the world, shine upon us. Set us free by the truth you now bring us. Shine on me. Shine on me. Shine, Jesus, shine. Fill this land with the Father's glory. Place, Spirit, place. Set our hearts on fire.
Thank you, guys. We have the privilege this morning to receive Holly and Taylor Rook into our church family by transfer of their membership. And I know that it's their favorite thing to stand up in front of all of you, so I'm going to ask them to do that, if you would, and respond to just one question. And we begin with an acknowledgement that you've already made your confession of faith and are a member of Christ Church. We ask you now to affirm that faith and to pledge to continue steadfastly in that faith as a member of this congregation, promising to share with us in Christian worship and service and to give of your substance as the Lord may prosper you for the work of the gospel. Do you promise to do that? Your response. Welcome. We're glad that you're here. The elders actually met with them a long, long time ago, but this is the first time we've had the chance to publicly receive them. So please join me in welcoming them. And I noticed I didn't have to tell them to sit down. <laughs> Before we go to God in prayer, we want to extend our Christian sympathy to Mary and Jack Hoffman in the death of Mary's sister, Barbara Cott, who passed away yesterday. Uh, the funeral arrangements are pending with the Wanig Funeral Home, so please add them to your prayer list. Let's go to God in prayer. God, thank you for calling us to be a part of your family, the family of God the Church of Jesus Christ. And thank you for calling Holly and Taylor Rook to be a part of this church family. And we pray that you would help them to continue to grow in their walk with you and help us do our part to encourage them in their walk with you. And thank you for the many ways in which you watch over us, giving us everything that we need and even going beyond our basic needs to many of our wants. Thank you for this day, a day that you have set apart for us to gather with your people, to sing your praises, to hear you speak to us from your word, and for us to be equipped to go into the world to share the good news of salvation in Jesus. We thank you for those that we partner with in your mission of sharing the good news. And this morning we lift up to you the work that John Winveen is doing God, guide him as he transitions away from full-time language study into part-time language study and part-time ministry. Also guide him in the process of getting up to speed on the projects that his sending agency is doing and help him to balance the transition well and help him to not lose focus on continually improving his language ability while also being able to start making contributions to the work that you've called him to. We also pray for the ministry of Pastor Elijah and Living Hope Uganda. We pray that our special offerings this month will enable him to continue the work that you've called him to do and that those funds would also be an encouragement to him. We lift up to you the ministry of freedom on the inside and ask for you to continue to bless the relationships that are formed with inmates uh, through those who are writing letters or visiting the inmates. We lift up to you Sandy Tennyson as she awaits sinus surgery on Tuesday. Prepare her, prepare her surgeon for that surgery and give Sandy the peace that only you can give. We pray for Sue Hartman and Connie LeClaire as they recover from surgery and as they go through physical therapy. Give them the, the determination and the wisdom needed to cooperate with you in the healing process. We pray for Nick Hilblink as he begins his last round of chemotherapy this week. And as he looks forward to transitioning back to work in the near future. God bless that whole process. We lift up to you Gary DeMaster as he begins follow-up tests this week and as he awaits the result of those tests. Give to him and Francine a very special sense of your presence. We pray for Chip Lemko and Carol Bosco as they receive hospice care in their homes. 
Help them to treasure the time that they have with family and with friends. We lift up to you Tom Horn as he goes through kidney dialysis. And we lift you Carol Klarman and Bert Tempest as they recover from recent surgeries. Give each of them what they, fa- what they need to face each day's challenges. And we pray for Mary Lammers as she continues her treatment for cancer. We pray, Lord, that those treatments will be effective with only a minimum of side effects. We pray for your comfort and your peace to rest upon Tom and Kathy Wensink and Dave and Joan Dykstra as they grieve over the death of Tom and Joan's brother, Don. And we pray for Mary and Jack Hoffman and the death of Mary's sister, Barb. God, give to these families the peace that passes all understanding. And Lord, we lift up to you the the gathering of the Wisconsin classes that will take place on Tuesday in Wisconsin Rapids. Guide the delegates as they gather to be equipped and also as they make decisions uh, that will affect the life of your church. Father, guide each of us as we seek to serve you daily. Help us to look to you for the wisdom and the strength that we need to be effective in carrying out that mission that you've called us to. Hear our prayers. We lift it to you in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. We're going to sing together hymn number 504, He Touched Me. Let's stand together to sing. Please be seated. As we come to God's word, that is our prayer, that God will, through the Holy Spirit, touch us in our minds and our hearts for the living of our lives through his word, which is from Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus, chapter 2, reading verses 1 through 10. Please join with me there, either in your own Bibles or as you see it printed or up on our screens. This is the word of God. You were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once lived, following the course of this world, following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. All of us once lived among them in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of flesh and senses, and we were by nature children of wrath like everyone else. But God, who is rich in mercy 
out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the results of works, so that no one may boast, for we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. This, this is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. This morning, I'd like to start by sharing a little bit of a story, if you will, about a town out west. Uh, Idaho Falls, Idaho is the city, which isn't a huge city, but it's a pretty good sized city. And it's a city that is located in the south part of Idaho, not too far from the borders of Wyoming or Utah. And it's nestled along the Snake River in a beautiful valley. And in Idaho Falls, there's an airport. Let's, I've got a picture of that airport for you. In fact, pretty much looks like an airport, right? You know, you can look at the buildings and say, yeah, that's an airport. And if you were to see more pictures of that airport, you notice the trees and such around here. It's in a beautiful spot. And this airport isn't anything big. There's only a couple of runways, but it's the second busiest airport in the state of Idaho. And it's a little regional airport that does a lot of good things for the people that live there, especially because it's primarily used commercially by businesses. So it's an airport that is really needed and has helped keep this city alive and going and has provided a great service for that region. Right next to this airport, there's a little over 60 acres of land that is absolutely beautiful. And that 60-some acres of land is made up of what's called Freeman Park. And Freeman Park is a beautiful spot, as you can see. A river winding along its side, waterfalls rippling there along the edges of the green spaces in the park. The park provides a lot of different activity for people in that area. You can play horseshoes there. You can play frisbee golf there. You can wander about on the trails that are there. It provides places for the community to gather and listen to music in a band shelter. It provides places for the community to gather to play games as there are about five different baseball and softball diamonds located within the complex. There's a lot of different amenities. It provides places for families to come and have picnics together and have shelters there to escape the sun or the rain, whatever is there that day. It's a beautiful spot. There's another picture of kind of a sunset view of some of the rapids. Isn't it beautiful? And it provides even a neat view of part of the city you can see off in the distance there of Idaho Falls itself. What a gorgeous place, right? It didn't always look this way. This land where that airport and this park were weren't always so beautiful, wasn't always so useful. It used to look something like this. It used to be the site of the sanitary landfill where people brought their garbage. The place where the things that people no longer wanted were thrown. The place where the things that were all used up were placed, gotten rid of, cast off, no longer wanted. Stuff that people considered bad, rotten, not useful anymore, was brought there. 
And that's where it was left. And then in the late 1950s, the city of Idaho Falls decided to reclaim that land and transfer, let's go back one slide, into that spot. To reclaim it means to recall something from a wrong or improper use or conduct. It's to rescue something that's in an undesirable state. It is to retrieve or recover something that has been lost. For something to be reclaimed means that that something which was once deemed unusable is now given a new purpose, a new life. Paul writes to the church in Ephesus a very powerful letter. And the letter he writes to the church in Ephesus really was written to Ephesus, but it was also written as a circa letter. A circuit letter means it's a circuit letter. So it was to be kind of taken on the circuit like a band might go, like these guys might go someday, right? Uh, So to go out on tour, so to speak, and go from place to place bringing its message. They're laughing at that yellow over there, aren't they? (laughs) But that's what this letter was meant to do. To go from church to church to bring this message to the church, and it's making its circuit here to us this morning. Powerful words from Paul, wanting us to understand truly the depths of what has happened to us, to our state. See, he's writing to people, both Jew and Gentile alike, who it's hard for them to truly grasp what grace means. And I think the church and the world today still struggles with it. For the Jews, it was hard. They were used to that way of life, of sacrifice, of having to bring something, having to do something to receive that forgiveness. And really, that's a way in which our world operates most of the time. We have to do something. We have to go to that person. We have to to tell them how sorry. We have to show them how sorry we are. To be forgiven. Here Paul wants us to see this image of what it really means, grace. And he begins with those first three words, which are so abrupt. Right? He doesn't soften this. doesn't use words like, you know, once you were fallen asleep, or once you were passed away, you know, like we try to soften the word dead. You know, we don't want to say dead. You are dead. Dead. There's no maybe about dead. Right? If you're dead, you're dead. Not useful anymore. No life any longer. You're dead. You're dead. There's a finality, a power in that word. And Paul wants them to hear that you were dead. But it comes across a little strange, doesn't it? You were dead. We don't usually talk that way because that's odd it's usually someone is dead not you were dead you were dead as you lived in your sins and trespasses as you followed the ways of the world as you followed the ways of the spirit of the air which is a reference to satan that's being used there as you were caught up by the ways of the flesh. What Paul is trying to get us, the church, to understand is that when we're living our lives according to those ways, we're falling into the trap of living for the self. And any life that's lived 
outside of Christ is live for the self. I don't care what they say. I don't care what good they're doing. It's done for the self. In one way, shape, or form, those good deeds even are being done for selfish reasons. Because that's what I think a good person ought to do. Because I think that's what other people think I ought to do as a good person. And I want to be seen as a good person. It all comes down to my definition then of what is good or what is right, according to me. And anything that comes down to my definitions of what those is, is regarding to the self. And I'm living to myself, making myself the one who dictates all things. Making myself God. And any time we live to the self or anyone's self, there is no life in it. When we are living, doing something that is self-serving, in order to feel the joy or happiness out of that thing, we have to keep doing it. Because once it's over, it loses it for us. It's done. Because there's no life in it. There's no true life in it. And so when we're living to the self... It's a dead life. And that's what Paul is wanting the people to hear. He's wanting the, you were dead in living in these ways. You're living for the self and that life is dead. It goes nowhere and it is nowhere. You see, Paul's not just referring as he makes this reference to a one day kind of death. He's referring to this death that's through life and forever. And so he paints this very real, very dark picture. You were dead. And then the great contrast. But God. But God. Who is rich in mercy. Now, when we hear the word rich, we automatically have certain things in our minds, right? We have, like, lots of money. That's typically what we're thinking of when we think of rich in mind. We think of having an abundance. That's not what rich is, really. By definition, rich is about having more than you need. It's an excess. More than what you need to meet your needs. God who is rich in mercy. God's mercy is Rich, it's more than enough to meet the need for our deadness, right? For all of the stuff that we have done, for all of the stuff that we do, for all of the sin, all of the trespasses, all of the wandering after ourselves, all of that stuff, all of that darkness, all of that that seems so bleak and so terrible, there's more than enough mercy. More than enough. God who is rich in mercy. Through Jesus Christ, this great love is shown. This love of God in Jesus Christ, which conquers all things, this love of God, this great love of God comes in and changes our lives, makes us alive. Makes us alive. Isn't that a powerful thing for us to begin to think about? That we are made alive. That we are given a purpose again. Our lives are changed. This is a dramatic change. This is an Easter kind of change. This is from death to life that we're talking about here. Paul wants us to realize the true power of what God has done for us. Nothing done by ourselves. He's completely trying to help us see that the self is completely taken out of this so that no one can boast. This has nothing to do with the self. This has nothing with what you're able to do at all because it's not about you. Because true life, the life that never stops, the life that never dies is found in this selfless gift of God. God. 
God gives of himself in giving us Christ. That we might see where true life, true love, true power resides. And to realize that that is the one and only victory. And the only way of victory is in Jesus Christ. So that what was lost, what was deemed unusable, what was seen as no longer needed or wanted, cast off, is suddenly given new life, new purpose. Every one of us comes here this morning holding some thought, action from just this past week that no one else knows about because we don't want them to know. There's something that we did, said, thought, we don't want those sitting around us now, especially maybe, to know. The guilt, the shame washes over us, and we think about that, and we just want to hide it. We don't want anybody to know about it. And I'm not telling us that we have to bring that out to each other. Don't hear what I'm not saying. But we all have those. And what often happens is we don't stop there, because then we start looking at those sitting around us, and we can sometimes even get angry because we begin thinking about how they would think about us if they knew this about us. And then we get mad about that because we know they're not perfect either. And so then we think they're judgmental and you know, we can go in this cycle. And it breaks down the community when we start stirring ourselves around in that garbage and getting lost in it. What do you suppose would happen if I would go to Brian Berg and can get one of his pieces of great equipment there and travel out to Idaho Falls and go to this park and start trying to find that garbage and start digging around in it. Is it going to do any good? It's just going to stir up stuff. It's just going to create a mess. It's been dealt with. It's been covered. And in theory, ecologically, in theory, what's supposed to happen is that now, after these years of being buried in the thousands of loads of dirt that have been brought out there to cover it, it's supposed to have broken down and become very much a part of the earth there. Part of the beauty. Part of the system. And while I can't speak to the reality of that, the illustration is the truth of what Paul is telling us. It's been covered. And it's become a part of the beauty of the redemption of God and Jesus Christ. The garbage of our lives, the sin, the trespasses, the desires of following after the ways of the world and the flesh transformed by that grace unmerited favor, undeserved, unearned, but efficient and sufficient, a power beyond anything else to make that garbage a beautiful story of redemption, of God's love and transformation in us. We don't have to hide you see, what Paul's going back to here is really going all the way back to Genesis and saying that problem of sin and death is taken care of. That curse has been lifted. Your lives have been changed, transformed. Reclaimed. 
by God's love to be a beautiful, beautiful and useful testimony to the grace of God in Jesus Christ. To be a beautiful tool that helps people in their lives. That helps others love God and to love each other. It's like being able to look at a reclaimed piece of land and see its beauty and enjoy its beauty and to see God's handiwork and to, to praise God for that beauty and to enjoy it with others and to celebrate the fun of life and relationship in there, in that place. That's what our life is meant to be when it's reclaimed. A thing of beauty in which this creation of God is celebrated, enjoyed, brings praise to the name of Jesus Christ. And has lived in love. This is our calling. And in this season of Lent, as we examine our lives, it's not about digging in our garbage. It's about seeing how that's all been changed. And how we can live in that new life and purpose we've been given in Christ. Because we, we've been reclaimed. Let us pray. And gracious God, we know that you indeed are here in this place, arms open wide, to receive us. There is not one person here. There is not one thing that's been done that is awful enough or ugly enough to be greater than your grace, greater than your mercy. So we come to receive that grace, to hold on to that mercy. And as we lift our hearts to you, O oh God, I just pray that each heart will be encouraged by that good news, will be lifted up by the power of what you have done, to know that transformation in their own lives, and to believe in that transformation for others. So God, we come. Amazed at your love and your grace. Praying that it will revive us. Grant us vision that we may love you and love others and to live in the freedom and the joy of a life that is now and forever. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us continue to worship as we give of our morning offering. And at the same time, would you pass those black uh, folders, friendship pads uh, down the aisle and sign those and pass them back as we are led in music where we fall down.
The greatness of mercy and love at the feet of Jesus. We cry, holy, holy, holy. We cry, holy, holy, holy. We cry, holy, holy, holy. Is the land. We fall down, we lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus, the greatness of. Mercy and love at the feet of Jesus. We cry, holy, holy, holy. We cry, holy, holy, holy. We cry, holy, holy, holy. Is the Lamb. the land. Let us pray. Holy God, we come, and indeed, we come before you humbly, but we come before you gratefully, giving you thanks for all that you've done for us, but mostly for Jesus Christ. And so we come bringing these gifts, bringing our lives, that they may be a pleasant offering, beautiful and acceptable to you, and that they may be used for your glory and your honor to reach out with your love into our world. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, know that you have been reclaimed by a power that has completely changed your life. And may you go forth to live in that joy. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the presence and power of the Holy Spirit go with you. And all of God's people said, Amen.